Welcome everybody and welcome to Becoming a Vanguard Chef. I'm Jennifer Methvin and I'm the Chancellor at ASUBB and we're so excited to have each of you with us for Vanguard Discovery Camp 2021. We're going to have a lot of fun today in, in the session with me, but there are lots of sessions and you're going to have a great, great time in these couple of weeks. We're going to focus today on cooking, you becoming a chef. But the thing is, we're going to learn just a little bit of science, a little physical science, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of math as we go along. And oh, by the way, if you didn't know it, you can't be a chef if you're not going to be an artist, right? So there's a little art involved today. So here's what I encourage you to do. We're going to run through these recipes with you pretty quickly. You're going to see me and my husband, Roger, demonstrate these recipes. Just watch. You are being provided uh, both the ingredient list and the recipes. We're going to give you lots of suggestions. So just sit back and learn. And then you can grab an adult, get out all the kitchen appliances and get busy to create your own really beautiful lunch. Okay, so we're going to start with making butter. We're going to need that butter because we're going to make some beautiful cornbread and we're going to use chemistry to make that cornbread. Then we're going to make a pot of soup, really quick vegetable soup that you're going to have tons and tons of options of how you can uh, make that soup taste, how you can prepare it and how you can serve it. And then of course we've got to have dessert. So we're going to come back to that same cream we're going to use to make the butter and we're gonna make whipped cream, get some fresh fruit and make a really, really beautiful dessert. You'll be able to do all of this even if you've never cooked anything at all. And I look forward to enjoying this time with you as you become a Vanguard chef. All right, well, welcome back. We're gonna get started by making butter. I don't know if you've made butter before, but it is a whole lot of fun and I have to have some assistance. This is my husband, Roger. This takes a lot of physical science to make butter, a lot of shaking, right? So when you take something like cream and you make changes to it, but you don't make a chemical reaction, that's when you're using physical science. So think about this. If I took a piece of fruit and I cut that piece of fruit up, I've changed it physically, right? It's a different shape, but it's still a piece of fruit. It's still an apple, <laughs> it's still, um, a pear, whatever it is. Well, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this cream today and actually do several things with it. Um, and we're gonna physically change it so that we can have butter. Now, Roger would tell you that he grew up on a farm, on a dairy farm, where they milked cows every day, twice a day, even at Christmas, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, that shocked me, even at Christmas. And so the cream, if you're on a farm and you milk cows, the cream is the fat in the milk. And it's lighter than the rest of the milk and it comes to the top. And Roger's dad, my father-in-law, would take that cream out of the top of the milk tank and use it on his cereal. And it's really, really sweet and really, really fat. But we're not going to milk cows today. We got our cream at the store, right? So when you're looking for cream, look for something that says heavy cream or heavy whipping cream. It's the same thing, okay? We're gonna take this cream and we're gonna put it in this jar, about a cup, maybe a little bit less than a cup. And we're going to put just a little bit of salt, right? Because we like food that has salt in it and the taste of that. And we, meaning Roger, is gonna shake and shake and shake. And you're going to see the physical changes that happen to cream when you apply that shaking pressure to it, okay? So clean jar, very, very clean jar. About a cup, maybe a little less of cream. Clean lid, put that lid on. Whoops, I forgot the salt, didn't I? Yeah, I forgot the salt. All right, look, you're just gonna do a very tiny, tiny bit of salt. Put a little bit of salt in your hand like that. You can measure it if you want to. It's about an eighth or less um, of a teaspoon of salt, but just a little, just a few granules out of your hand there. All right, lid on, lid on tight. If you'll set this cream out, not this box of cream, put it right back in the refrigerator so that it stays good. But if you'll put it in your measuring cup and set it out for just a little while and let it get just a little bit warm, this will be a little bit easier, okay? Now this is gonna take a little while. 
We'll speed it up a little bit. But we're gonna start shaking this jar and then we'll stop every now and then and tell you what's going on. The first thing you want to happen is that you stop hearing milk slosh. Okay, so let's get shaking. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. And we've been shaking this jar of cream, you know, and it sounded sloshy. Well, it stopped sounding sloshy now. So I want you to see what's happening. What does that look like? Looks like whipped cream, isn't it? Yeah, well it is. That is what whipped cream is. What whipped cream is, is air and cream, right? So we have physically added air. The air that was in the jar is now mixed in with all that cream, okay? That makes whipped cream, right? We could stop there. We didn't doctor it up to be whipped cream. Remember, we're making butter. So now we've heard the milk, we've heard the sloshing stop. We're gonna shake, 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 shake some more until we start hearing the sloshing again, all right? So here we go. See that some of the milk is starting to separate. That air in there is starting to pick up the milk. And what's happening with the fat molecules is that we've shaken it so much that that little membrane that protects them, they're breaking. And as they break, there's nothing around that fat molecule to protect it. And so those fat molecules are beginning to stick together. Again, just physical science. We haven't had a chemical reaction. We're just doing this with motion but we're gonna get butter out of the rest of that milk shortly when all those fat molecules stick together. Coming out of those air bubbles, those fat molecules are sticking together and separating themselves from the rest of the liquid. That's how we're gonna get butter. So you see there's liquid and you see there's fat. And those fat molecules now aren't protected with the little membrane. They have all formed into one big glob and you've got butter. The solid is the butter. The liquid is what we call buttermilk. We wanna make sure we get that, that liquid out of there. So you can use a strainer like this. You can use your hands if you need to, right? And by the way, you don't have to work this hard to do this. You can actually do this with a mixer you know, electric mixer like you have in your kitchen, you can actually do that. But shaking it in a jar is so much more fun. You know how they used to do it, right? They'd have a huge crock, and it had a big paddle in it, and they would push that paddle up and down to make the motion that would break up the fat molecules, get the membrane off of them, and get them to stick together, right? Now this is not exactly buttermilk like you have in the store. <laughs> buttermilk like you have in the store has been pasteurized and cultured a lot of times. So um, we're gonna use this buttermilk in our next recipe in um, our cornbread. But I'll talk about then. It's not exactly the same as the buttermilk that you get in the store because we're working with cream that has been pasteurized, right? All right, it's really important that that buttermilk get out of the milk, I mean, get out of the butter. So I'm gonna run over to the sink and rinse it with really, really cold water for just a little bit. And we're gonna put it in this dish and you'll have a beautiful dish a very delicious butter. All right, now that we've got some really, really delicious butter, we need something to have to put that butter on. So we're gonna make some cornbread today. And while we make cornbread, I wanna talk just a little bit about chemistry. You know, when we talked about butter, we physically changed that cream we knocked it around enough, right, until we got those uh, fat molecules to stick together. That's physical science, that's a physical change. But sometimes when you're cooking, what you have is a chemical change. And so what happens is the separate uh, molecules that are in something, they repair off, they recombine up. They're not just there together as a mixture, right? They actually recombine to make something new. And a lot of times what those are, you, you know what water's made of, right? It's chemical formula for water, H2O, right? Two hydrogens and one oxygen. Well, a lot of times hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon in food, when there's a chemical reaction, those molecules will rearrange 
right? They'll recombine and they will make something new and different and you can't change it back, right? So chemical reactions help cooking in just a whole lot of ways. Think about making a cake, right? Something about that cake, some chemical reaction has to happen so that cake is fluffy. You mix all of those things in your cake batter together and you put them in a pan, right? It's a lot shorter than your cake is going to be. But a chemical reaction happens to create air um, or some, some kind of um, uh, molecules that will, that will make it rise up. It's called leavening. Some sort of leavening reaction will happen and that cake will rise. The same is going to happen in our cornbread. We're gonna to have to have a chemical reaction that infuses some air into, into it so that that cornbread will rise. But we're also gonna have another kind of chemical reaction when we cook it. But let's talk about that um, chemical reaction that we're gonna have that will make that cornbread rise. You're probably familiar with baking powder, right? And baking, baking soda and baking powder. Well, when you have two things that react together, make a chemical reaction, then something happens and you get something new. That is what is happening with baking powder. Baking powder in any moisture will have a chemical reaction, right? And baking soda in any acid, like vinegar, will have a chemical reaction. And you're familiar with this one. Have you made a volcano? right out of baking soda and vinegar and what happens that baking soda just goes everywhere right well it's because those molecules are rearranging and it's actually making making carbon dioxide which bubbles right like a coke bubbles um, it bubbles and that's what puts the air into the food puts the space into the food and makes it rise up okay so let me show you what i'm talking about powder and this one is baking soda um, baking soda you're familiar with, so let me do baking powder first. I'm going to take just a little bit of water, a little bit of H2O, and I'm going to put it here. With our baking powder, and you see all those bubbles? That's what makes your pizza dough rise, your cakes rise. That's what's going to make our cornbread rise. And that's just water. Anytime two substances come together and get all upset and then start rearranging and, and sharing uh, molecules, you have science, you have chemistry, you have a chemical reaction is what you're gonna learn that's called, okay? Well, with baking soda, water wouldn't do it. Water wouldn't do it. It has to take something that's an acid, but it's basically the, the same. <laughs> if I can get the vinegar open, it's basically the same. So water wouldn't have any chemical reaction. You'd have toothpaste is what you would have, right? But if we pour some vinegar, and I don't want to get too big a volcano, you're very familiar with that one. Okay, we need to get some, some cornbread going in, in the oven here. So that chemical reaction that you just saw with the baking powder is what's gonna make our corn muffins rise up, be tall little cakes um, in their pans. That's the chemical reaction that'll be there. Now, I gave you two choices about how you might go about this. One is the easy way, right? Cornmeal, flour, and baking powder is in this box. And lots of boxes like this, right? And that's one way you can get cornbread and that's the way we're going to do it today. But I also included in your packet um, the way that you could mix those things together, a recipe you can use to mix those things together, um, and you don't need the box, right? Um, so if you do that, I need you to understand as a Vanguard chef that there is a difference between liquid measuring containers and dry measuring containers, okay? So I've got a couple different kind of uh, measuring containers for liquid. This is actually one that when you use it like this, with the cup side up, it's, it's a wet one. You can turn it over if it didn't have anything in it and push this down and it would be a dry um, measuring cup. But you don't want to measure flour in a cup, measuring cup that's made for measuring liquids. 
you won't get the math right. And if you don't get the math right, then you won't get the science right. And if the chemistry in your cake or your cornbread or your bread or your biscuits is not right, they won't taste right. They won't taste as good as they could. So dry ingredients like flour and meal, if you decided you were gonna mix the cornbread yourself, you need a set of dry um, measuring cups. Liquid things like oil, milk, those things you wanna use a wet measuring cup, all right? So we're gonna do the easy way today. We're gonna open this box of Jiffy, it's my favorite. Um, mix. And again, the cornmeal, the flour. Cornmeal's in there, flour's in there, a little bit of sugar's in there, and your baking soda is already in there. We're gonna dump that like that, and if you read the back of it, it'll tell you that you need a third of a cup of milk and an egg. Well, guess where we're gonna get our milk? Remember our milk from our buttermilk? We take the fat out, right? We're gonna use that milk as our third cup of milk, if I can find it, oh, it's in here. We're gonna use this buttermilk that we made from making the butter. And then I've got an egg right here, and we're gonna gently mix it, all right? I usually take a fork, get those lumps out of there, so it's a little bit smoother. If you've ever watched anybody make bread or cornbread from scratch, you might see them take a thing called a sifter and put the flour in the meal and all that through it so it'll be really nice and smooth. All right, we're gonna add that third a cup of milk that we got from our butter. And we're gonna add an egg. All right. We're gonna mix that up. Just mixing it with the fork. You don't need the electric mixer. You just wanna break that egg up. And the thing about buttermilk is you don't wanna over mix it, right? Cause you can almost kinda of see that it's getting airy in there. That chemical reaction between the milk and that baking powder is already happening. And if you work on it too long, you'll knock those air bubbles out. So you don't wanna mix it too long. All right, let me clear a spot. We're gonna prepare these for the oven. Now you might remember a couple of things. One is that we took all of the fat out of that buttermilk. And so I'll tell you a little secret. This cornbread will taste just a little bit better. If you'll just put about a tablespoon of oil, I use olive oil. You could use vegetable oil canola oil, just a little bit of oil in there to replace that fat that we took out of our milk. Just some cornbread recipes, you'll see the, the mix, box mix will tell you to put oil in there. All right, we're gonna make corn muffins. If you don't have a muffin tin, there's a whole lot of choices of what you can do. I like to make cornbread in one of these two skillets a lot. If you do that, you wanna put oil in the bottom of it. Again, vegetable oil or olive oil, and you know what? Set it in the oven. We preheated the oven at 350. Set it in the oven and let it get really hot. And then pour that cornbread batter in the skillet. It'll seal real quickly, get really brown on the bottom, and then you can get it out of your skillet a little bit better. But since we're having this nice soup meal today, we're gonna use um, a muffin pan. Mine's a silicone one, they make metal ones. And you want to take Pam, or a paper towel and some oil, and you want to get those really greased up there. All right. You can see that that mix is already larger than it was just a couple minutes ago. It's because that chemical reaction is happening. We're getting air in there. So we're gonna put these in muffin tin. And again, it made carbon dioxide. Took a carbon and, and two oxygens and made something new. We can't get the cornmeal back out of this now. We can't get the cornbread. I mean, we can't get the flour. This is something new and different. It's had a chemical reaction. All right. All right, we're gonna put those corn muffins in the oven. We're gonna set the timer for about 20 minutes. 
and you will see that chemical reaction and another reaction will continue to happen. The baking will also happen and it'll change that cornbread um, into a totally new substance. While it's doing that, we're gonna make some soup to go with the cornbread. Okay, we have some wonderful butter. We have some lovely cornbread going that had a chemical reaction where two substances reacted together to make those bubbles and make it fluffy. We wanna make some soup and talk about another way that you can have a chemical reaction. Sometimes when you add two things together, they don't automatically have a chemical reaction. Sometimes you have to introduce a little heat um, to help out the situation. That is usually what's happening when you're cooking, right? So many times when you're cooking, you're adding heat. I could take this carrot, right? I'll peel it here in a minute for our soup, but it'll still be a carrot. I can cut it up, right? It'll still be a carrot. We back to those physical changes like when we made the butter, right? But when we put them in this pan and add some heat, you'll notice some things start happening, right? Food changes color. This carrot will change the colors a bit as it's heated up. You'll start to smell things in the air. Then you know that the heat is helping make a chemical reaction. Once we cook this carrot, it will be different. It'll be a cooked carrot and we can't turn it back into a raw carrot. And that's one of the ways that you can know that a chemical reaction has happened. You can't undo it, right? If I take sand and rocks and I put them in a bucket together, I've made a mixture. But if I wanted to, and I don't know why you would want to, but if I wanted to, I could get all the rocks back out from the sand, right? That's not chemistry, nothing new happened. But when I cook this carrot, I can't get the raw carrot back out of the cooked carrot. It's just not possible. And that's because of the chemical reaction. So when you're cooking, when you see food change colors, like that cornbread went in there pretty yellow and it's gonna come out pretty golden, right? It's having a heat chemical reaction in there right now as well. When you see it change colors, when you see it smell, when you smell something different, it's giving off gas. Good sign that there has been a chemical reaction. That's what's gonna happen as we cook this soup, right? So here's what's gonna happen. I ask you to get several large carrots, right? We're gonna need to peel these carrots and I really encourage you, use these kinds of carrots, you know, that come in a big bag that we're gonna have to peel. They have more taste, they have more flavor, and they have a few more vitamins concentrated in there. And they just work just a little bit better in making a soup than those smaller carrots do, okay? We're also gonna need an onion. I know lots of Vanguard chefs probably don't like an onion, right? But the onion in your soup is gonna add sweetness. We're going to have it make a chemical reaction when we put it in oil and cook that onion up. And it's not gonna taste like raw onion taste when it's finished. In fact, it's gonna get pretty sweet and add some sweetness and some flavor to your soup. So we're gonna need to dice an onion. We're gonna need some carrots. We need some uh, beef broth, I mean some chicken broth or chicken stock, right? Do y'all know the difference between broth and stock? Broth you make by boiling a chicken. Stock you make by boiling bones and other things like carrots and and other vegetables. That's the difference between a broth and a stock. Doesn't matter. You can use chicken, you can use beef, you can use vegetable, and you can use stock or broth for this. It doesn't matter at all, all right? So we're gonna prepare some vegetables. Again, when you're doing this, make sure you have adult around. We're gonna use some kitchen tools that are a little bit sharp, and we're gonna prepare our carrots and our onion, and then we'll show you how to put it together to make a soup. as you cut these carrots up that you think about that they have to cook at the same time. So you see how that ends fatter and that ends smaller? So we'll make these about like that because these are gonna take longer to cook because they're so thick. So those two kind of match because you want them to cook at about the same time. As you get down here to the skinnier part, right, they can be a little bit longer. So something like that until you have about five or six cups of carrots.
Nobody likes to cut up onions, and I really like kitchen gadgets. So, once I get an onion peeled, I can just put it in several large pieces, and I have this wonderful thing called an onion chopper. It's really, really cool. So you lift it up, it's got a blade right there. I put a piece of onion in there, and here's my favorite part, it's really, really loud. And you've chopped your onion. So I have a whole onion chopped in here and ready to go, and I didn't cry not one time. All right, let's put this soup together. We need our olive oil, which I keep putting up. Ah. Okay, we're gonna put our soup together. I have a soup pot. This one's pretty big for the soup we're gonna make, but it's my favorite soup pot and it holds heat really well. And I'm gonna turn the eye on to about medium high um, for this. And I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons of olive oil to the bottom of this pot. Just lightly cover the bottom of that pot. And let it heat up for just a minute. And when it begins to get warm, you begin to hear, feel the heat, then we'll put these onions right in there um, with that oil. And again, what's gonna happen is we're gonna begin to cook these onions you're gonna to begin to see them change and get a little bit more clear. You're going to start to smell them, right? Um, you're definitely gonna start smelling that they're smelling um, a little different. And you will know that a chemical reaction is happening that is helped out with heat. Heat helps chemical reactions sometimes. Um, and that is almost always the case in cooking. So let's let that heat up and we'll begin to saute our onion. That's gonna be a lot of onion. Gonna take a look at that onion. That's about the size you wanna make that if you need to cut it with a knife. Again, have an adult along if you need to cut it um, with a knife, but tell your adult about this really cool gadget right here. So we are going to put this onion right down in here. And you hear that sizzle going on there. The chemical change is already starting to happen. And we're gonna saute this for a few minutes. Okay, we can see these little dices of onion here. They're starting to get a little bit opaque. opaque. You can start to see through them just a little bit. You can certainly smell, and it's smelling different than that raw onion smell. At this point, you wanna give them a little salt. Just a little bit of salt to add a little flavor there. And what's happening is that some sweetness is coming out of those onions, so they're not gonna taste like raw onions at all. You're not even gonna know they're in the soup by the time we get finished with the soup, okay? And when they get good and translucent, start looking a different color, and then we can put everything else in. So you've got your five or six cups of carrots. You put those in, just put them right in there like that. They're different shapes, but they're about the same size so that they'll cook at about the same time. I'm gonna add just a little bit more salt. And then we talked about it. We're gonna add, um, I use chicken broth, and I will usually use low sodium or no sodium chicken broth. That's why you have to taste food, get a clean spoon, taste food, because a lot of the things we make that we cook with, they already have a lot of salt in them. So sometimes you don't have to add as much salt as other times. We're going to put the whole box of this chicken broth right in here. And this is gonna be the base of our soup. If you like soupy soup, you can put more chicken broth. If you like really thick soup, you can put more vegetables. There's nothing magical. I'll tell you the truth, I usually don't measure um, at all, I just put it, I just put it together. And we are going to bring this to a boil. So you're gonna bring it to a boil, and that heat is gonna work on those carrots, help them have a chemical reaction. Those molecules will rearrange, rearrange, and we'll get a cooked carrot instead of a raw carrot. And then we're gonna talk about the many ways that you could serve this soup. Um, lots of preparations for this soup. We'll put some seasoning in it, give you some choices about what you might put in for seasoning, but right now, they just need to boil for about 20 minutes. Okay, 
while we're waiting on that soup to boil those carrots, we're gonna check our cornbread. Doesn't that look pretty? See, it's golden now, not just yellow, but golden brown. That brown tells you we have a chemical reaction. But how do you know if it's done or not, right? If you take a toothpick and very carefully stick it down in there, and the toothpick comes out clean, that means it's done. The moisture's taken care of. We have done cornbread. So I'm gonna get that out and let it begin to cool off just a little. All right, while we let those carrots continue to boil and make sure those carrots get really tender, let's talk about why I said this was cream of carrot soup. You know these soups, right? That you can get in cans, cream of anything, cream of chicken, cream of mushroom. If you've had uh, green bean casserole at Thanksgiving time, probably had some cream of something, cream of asparagus, something um, in there. Well, the kind of cream that's in a bought can of soup is probably not exactly cream, right? But we have been cooking all day with cream. So one of the things that we can do when this carrot soup gets done is eat it just like it is. We have chunks of carrot, we have sweet onion and broth. It'll taste wonderful. We'll spice it up a little bit with anything you like. I like to use Italian seasoning a lot, so I'll probably use Italian, Italian seasoning. We could add things to it and just make a vegetable kind of soup. You can take little green English peas straight from the freezer, from our freezer bag, and put them in there, and that warm soup will be enough to cook them. You can do um, corn off the cob out of the freezer the same way. You could open a can of green beans, dump out the liquid, right? Add them. You could make this whatever kind of vegetable soup you wanted. And instead of carrots, you could have done all kinds of things. I, I make a soup like this a lot that is out of cabbage, and carrots and celery. And I'm the only one in my house who likes it, but I like it a lot, right? Um, so you can do whatever you, whatever kinds of vegetables you want, just cook them until they're done in broth. And it doesn't always have to be broth either. I make some soups where you start with a jar of V8 juice, right? It's vegetable juice. It's tomato juice with a whole lot more vegetables in it. And it makes a really good base for a soup. You have to add more things to it um, to give it that, that um, chicken flavor that we get from using chicken broth. Uh, but it's a perfectly great way um, to make soup. So there's lots of options. But the option we're gonna do today is when this soup gets finished, we're gonna let it cool off and we're gonna put it in the blender and chop it up into little bitty tiny pieces, right? The chemical reactions will be over with and we're gonna go back and do a physical reaction by putting it in a blender and chopping it all up. Putting it back in this pan, bringing it to a low boil and adding some of that wonderful cream that we have been working with all day. And then you will have cream of carrot soup. All right, see all that steam coming up out of there? All right, it's hard to know when these carrots are done. So one of the things you wanna do is take one of them Get it out, cool it off just a minute, and see if it's soft. If it's soft, it's ready. And I believe this is about ready. These carrots are getting soft. All right, so when they are as you as soft as you'd like to have them, which can be pretty, pretty soft, all the vitamins are going there in the water, then you wanna season it up however you want to. As I said, there's so many options. You could add other vegetables. You could add some flavors that you really like. Um, I like Italian seasoning and it's pretty easy. Comes in a big can like this, right? There are things in here like oregano and basil and thyme. And I have those things out in the yard, right? But they're a plant. And to get them dried like this, I would have to bring them in, dry them, pick them off the stem and all that sort of thing, which we do that sometimes too. But this is all wonderful seasoning right here together. It tastes really good. And you just put as much or as little as you want. I would probably sprinkle in here probably about a tablespoon. But as I said, I don't measure very much. When I'm baking, I measure, right? Because you gotta get the math right so that the chemistry will work right when you're baking, that those reactions will work right. But when I'm cooking otherwise, a lot of times I just shake it, taste it, and see how it's going. All right, we're gonna let this cool off, right? We're not gonna add noodles. You could add noodles, right? Put some noodles in here, a little extra water, boil it until the noodles were soft, and you have carrot noodle chicken broth soup, all kinds of things. We're gonna cool this off 
and we're gonna put it in a blender and we're gonna make cream soup. Okay, we've let our soup cool off quite a bit here. You really wanna make sure it's cool if you're gonna use an actual blender um, to, um, to, to chop up your soup. There's a couple other options. This is a potato masher. This is one of my favorite things in the world. This is a masher, like you can mash up hamburger meat or sausage when you're making tacos or lasagna or something like that. Both of these would work. It would just be a lot of work, right? And then you want this soup to be really, really um, smooth and creamy before you put that cream in there. So again, remember, taste it. Taste your broth, taste your carrots. Make sure your salt is right. Make sure your spice is right. That's pretty good. Um, I think I've got the salt right there. And again, you're gonna need an adult's help, but get your blender, right? And this is why we needed the soup cooled. We're gonna take a couple batches at a time of the soup, put it in the blender, puree it very, very fine, chop it up really small, and then get it back in this pan, and then we'll add the cream. You can probably cut this pretty short, Jay. So we're gonna have about four cups of soup and see it looks pretty creamy just like that. But that's still not cream of carrot soup. Cream of carrot soup is got to have cream. So we'll return it over here to the heat, but keep that heat really, really gentle and low. Okay, keep that heat pretty gentle. And you simply add two more cups of cream. Same cream, heavy whipping cream. We're gonna make one more dish after this one out of heavy whipping cream, but you pour it into that soup and it becomes a very, very rich Very, very delicious soup. You're gonna gently stir it in, and you really just wanna heat it now until the cream gets warm. And then you can serve it up in pretty bowls, and we'll do that after we make the dessert as well. So we'll let that gently heat up. I'll tell you another secret. You might just put just a little bit of butter in there, just a tiny bit, make it taste better too. So there you have cream of carrot soup. Okay, we have some beautiful cornbread, some lovely, really creamy, nice butter, some beautiful cream of carrot soup um, to eat here. We've got to fix a dessert before we sit down and have this lovely meal, right? So you remember when we were making butter, we started out talking about physical changes, right? Before we moved into the chemical changes of cooking. And we took that cream and we shook and we shook and we shook. And after a while, that air that was in the jar it mixed up with the cream, and we really had what was whipped cream before we kept shaking and breaking it all back apart and getting those fat molecules to stick together and bringing us to butter. Well, might as well have a little whipped cream for our dessert here. We're gonna make what some people call a parfait, what some people call a trifle. Kind of depends on what you put in it, um, what you call it. But we're just gonna have two kinds of fresh fruit, something crunchy. This is granola because I like granola. You could crunch up some vanilla wafers. You could 
crunch up some other kind of vanilla cookie. You could use chopped up nuts like almonds, anything that give it a little bit of crunch and you need whipped cream, all right? So we're gonna start again with some of our cream. I think I have about a cup and a half there, somewhere in there. Now you remember when we added salt to the cream because most of us like salt in our butter. We buy butter that has salt in it or margarine that has salt in it. Um, well, that's not really whipped cream. What whipped cream usually has in it is a little bit of sugar, right? To make it a little bit sweet. This is gonna be a really healthy dessert, but we are gonna add just a little bit of powdered sugar. And again, since this is baking, I'm gonna be very, very precise with this. I want about a tablespoon of powdered sugar or confectioner's sugar, you might have heard it called. So I'm gonna take the blade of this knife here and kind of level that out so that I know that I've got a good tablespoon right there. Tablespoon of confectioner's sugar, powdered sugar, and a teaspoon of vanilla. We just like the taste of vanilla abstract and desserts. We Americans do, so we're gonna add just about there's a half a teaspoon, whoops. So there's a whole teaspoon. All right, let me clean up my mess here. And then all we have to do, right, is add the air back in here, just like we did when we made butter. Well, it would take several jars and a good little bit for us to make enough whipped cream for this dessert with that jar. So I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna use the hand mixer. Now I have one of these really cool wispy things on my hand mixer, but you don't have to have that. Your regular beaters on your hand mixer will do, all right? So we are gonna whip this until you, it becomes kind of stiff. You have stiff peaks. So you can take that um, cool whip, that whipped cream, and you, it'll stand up a little bit by itself. And then you wanna stop, right? Because if you keep beating it up, it's gonna turn into butter, right? You're gonna get those fat molecules out of there. So here we go. Get everything mixed in, then I'm gonna speed it up. You see the air going in there? It's air that makes pull cool up, it makes whipped cream. See that air is making it larger, but it's not whipped yet. test it. I don't think it's quite there. You see how it won't quite stand up by itself yet? Needs a little more. Getting close. There we go. It'll stand up by itself now, and it's really, really thick. And the reason you wanna stop just as soon as it gets that way is because you're just before breaking all those membranes apart. <laughs> and then once they break apart, the fat starts sticking together, we're past whipped cream, and we're on to butter, right? We can't reverse that um, at that point very easily. All right, whoops. Let me go, <laughs> that's good. My beater off here, and I'm gonna show you how to make a really, really pretty dessert. Can you keep going? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, this is a really, really simple dessert. You want at least two kinds of fruit, as I said, something crunchy and a clean spoon, right, for each thing. So some kind of glass that's gonna look really pretty that you can see everything in. And I'm gonna start with some of that pretty whipped cream down in the bottom to be the sweet, okay? And I'm gonna layer some of these strawberries here. Just to be kind of pretty in there. We like strawberries and blueberries because it's kind of like 4th of July, right? So there's your red. And maybe a teaspoon of blue, a tablespoon of blueberries, maybe a little bit more there. Okay. Now, some more cream before you do anything else. Put a little bit more cream right there. And now it'll taste better if you add something crunchy. So I'm gonna add some granola right in there. I like granola and it tastes really good with whipped cream, all right? And then you just layer again some of your strawberries. You can make it as artistic as you want to, make it really pretty. If you have one of those um, icing bags or even a Ziploc bag, bag you can um, put your Cool Whip, your whipped cream in that, and really make it pretty but I'm just going to do one nice little dollop of whipped cream right on top there. Well guys, thank you for cooking with me today. I think you're becoming a Vanguard chef. Let's think for a minute about what we've done. We've used a little physical science to make butter and whipped cream. We've used some chemistry to make cornbread and some soup. You've got lots of options of how you can serve these dishes. You can garnish this soup with some oyster crackers, or as we just did, cheese. We like cheese on everything, so we just added a little cheese um, to ours. Use your imagination. Cook safely in the kitchen. We provided you with these recipes, with the science behind them. Um, with a list of equipment and things that you will need. Grab an adult, create one of these great lunches, and enjoy your summer. Thanks for being with us.